Hello and welcome to another Healthy Bite. My name is Dr. Ron Early. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which I am recording this podcast. The Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Well, I don't think it matters how many times you actually talk about breathing. And I I know a reasonable amount about breathing. I've written about breathing. I'm doing a a very intensive course still on breathing to learn more about it from the wonderful Dr. Rosalba Courtney, who we've had on as a guest on this podcast. It's a six-month program. but And Patrick, I've had Patrick on as a guest. Uh, He's one of the first episodes uh, three or four years ago uh, on this Unstressed podcast, where we do talk more about the Buteyko method. But Patrick is just a wealth of information, and I love talking to him. And I thought that PALM, P-A-L-M acronym, which was really important, these are, these are things that which we should be using to assess our patients that have potentially sleep apnea. And it was the P stands for pharyngeal collapsibility because the airway collapses. And as we grow older, the tone of our airway becomes less, well, less toned and more susceptible to collapsibility. So pharyngeal uh, collapsibility is important. Arousal threshold is all about how easily you are awake, how um, a high arousal level means you'll wake up very easily. But this term, the loop gain, was really something, see, I'm always learning and I want to share it with you. And I had to find out more about loop gain because when Patrick said people with a high loop gain are far less able to tolerate mandibular advancement splints, well, I think that was that's, that's a really important point. So loop gain is an engineering method used, I'm quoting here, to measure the stability of the negative feedback chemo reflex control system. So within our brains, within our bodies, there are chemo receptors which respond to carbon dioxide levels, to all different levels, but specifically to carbon dioxide levels. The overall loop gain of the ventilatory system reflects the ratio of the ventilatory response to the disturbance that elicited that response. So loop gain equals ventilatory response divided by ventilatory disturbance. Okay, so it's a way of assessing whether your response to a particular activity is adequate, I guess, and therefore when breathing deviates from, and here's another term, apnea, E-U-P-N-E-A, the point where ventilation matches metabolic demand. Now, apnea is described as uh, normal, healthy, unlabored breathing in, in a mammal. And uh, it's uh, sometimes known as quiet breathing or rested, res- resting respiratory rate. Apnea, E-U-P-N-E-A. Now, um, there are terms uh, like you become familiar with, an apnea, where you actually stop breathing, or a hypopnea, where you have restricted breathing, But here's a term you don't hear very often for a very good reason, I guess, and that is apnea, normal, good, healthy, and unlabeled breathing. Now, Patrick's book, uh, The Breathing Cure, which I'm holding up for those watching, uh, is just an amazing uh, book. Uh, There's so much information in here, and, uh, and it was published in 2021. It's a brilliant book. I can, if you're wanting to explore more about breathing, Uh, then you could, it'd be hard to go uh, further than this book. Uh, But loop gain was something that Patrick had mentioned, and I must admit it wasn't something that I was uh, particularly familiar with. So, of course, when uh, I got the book, I immediately went back to, went to uh, page 404, quite a way into the book, uh, and wanted to read about loop gain. So I thought I'd share it with you. I don't mind reading a bit of book uh, for you and, and, and informing you after loop gain, after anatomical considerations, which are thickness around, this is my own um, addition here, which is when you put on weight, uh, thickening around the neck, fat around the neck, the fl- flaccidity of laryngeal muscles and pharyngeal muscles, which predispose you to collapse. So that's, that's an important, they're anatomical considerations. High loop gain is the greatest contributing factor in obstructive sleep apnea. Now, that's a really important statement. Affecting one-third of patients 
diagnosed with the condition. Patients with high loop gain have an exaggerated response to even small changes in the level of carbon dioxide. Now, people think breathing is so much about oxygen, but it's actually mainly about carbon dioxide levels because carbon dioxide levels in the lungs determine your pH. They balance out your acid alkali balance. And so it's carbon dioxide level, which is really critical factor. And pH in the blood is very narrow so for it to work effectively. For example, to take oxygen onto the hemoglobin molecule, you need a pH of 7.35. To release carbon dioxide at the site of where you need it, it's 7.45. So we work in a very narrow range of pH that's critically important. And that's why balancing out pH and that's why carbon dioxide levels are so important. And that's why um, breathing <laughs> gently and slowly uh, through the nasal passages from the diaphragm is what constitutes breathing well. Patients with high loop gain have an exaggerated response even to small changes in the level of carbon dioxide. Now, you know this is important, for example, if someone was to hyperventilate and overdo it, they keep pushing out carbon dioxide level to such a degree that you would eventually pass out which kind of slows your breathing right down and gives the body a chance for the carbon dioxide to build up again in your lungs because carbon dioxide is a waste product of energy, of producing energy. So this response, this exaggerated, having high loop gain is an exaggerated response to even small changes in the level of carbon dioxide. During an apnea, breathing temporarily stops. This makes it impossible for CO2 to leave the lungs. The gas accumulates in the blood. When a patient has a high loop gain, ventilation becomes exaggerated when breathing resumes. This faster and harder, harder breathing after an apnea leads to a sudden drop in blood CO2. As the level of CO2 in the blood becomes too low, the brain fails to adequately signal to, the breathe, to breathe, causing a central apnea. So that's the critical point. You know, when you stop breathing, it upsets the balance of carbon dioxide in the, in the blood, in the lungs, and your obstructive sleep apnea becomes a central sleep apnea. And we haven't done enough uh, work on central, uh, or enough podcasts on central sleep apnea, but you can see how this delicate balance of breathing well is so critically important to so many things in our body to well the balance of of co2 the balance of of ph acid alkali in the body determines for example smooth muscle smooth muscles contract when that balance goes out of balance so people who have a resistance to managing their high blood pressure. I was talking to a doctor just last week about a drug resistant hypertension, and they were having trouble balancing out or finding the correct medication for this patient who didn't matter what prescription of hypertensives they were giving them, they were having trouble controlling hypertension. It was interesting because the response to this was to use ultrasound and to ablate, uh, to do hypothermy, to actually destroy, I think, the muscle, the nerve supply um, to the kidneys, which were, which were involved in um, regulating uh, blood pressure. And, and I asked the doctor, had you ever thought of this uh, connection with breathing? Because if you hyperventilate, or if your breathing goes out of balance and your CO2 um, is out of balance, then smooth muscle will contract and blood vessels have smooth muscle in them. And they had never even thought of, of breathing as, as a factor in drug resistant hypertension. Another way this manifests itself is in young children who suffer from bedwetting, enuresis. We've talked about this on several podcasts, but enuresis, bedwetting. I mean, beyond the age when a child is toilet trained, 
they um, generally stop wetting their bed at night. They will get up at night to go to the bathroom rather than wet the bed. But this, in these uh, cases that we've seen in our practice where p children of 8, 10 or even 12 years old are still wetting their bed and they've gone to see urologists, neurologists, psychologists, again, no one has thought of breathing and its effect on body chemistry, which in turn affects smooth muscle, which is what the bladder is made of, um, to cause enuresis. And so with the use of micropore tape on the mouth at night to slow the breathing down, this cured this child's problem within one or two nights. Uh, and these people had spent tens of thousands, well, thousands, not tens of thousands, but thousands of dollars and many hours and many distressing hours um, uh, consulting all sorts of specialists and many distressing hours for this child who actually couldn't go to sports camps or sleepovers because she was so embarrassed that she may wet the bed. So it was life altering. But for us adults, getting up at night to go to the bathroom is a also a reflection in many cases of sleep disordered breathing. Now, getting up at night to go to the bathroom can be a reflection of other things, undiagnosed diabetes or poorly controlled diabetes, certain medications, of course, prostate problems in men as we get older. But a common factor that is often overlooked is getting up at night to go to the bathroom for to urinate. And um, I'm surprised when I take history in my practice of this being the case, not just once, but maybe even two or three times in a night. And uh, yet a breathing has been overlooked. So this story this week with uh, Patrick McEwen, The Breathing Cure, which was a wonderful, always so good to connect with him. And as I said, it doesn't matter how often I do programs on uh, breathing. I learn something new every single time, and I'm sure you do too. So this is a subject we're going to revisit again and again because we keep on learning new things. And loop gain was such an important thing because it it gives us a clue as to whether a patient may be able to use a mandibular advancement splints. Now, these are splints that fit in the mouth to keep the airway open. It holds the jaw, as the name implies, a mandibular advancement, mandible being the lower jaw, keeping the jaw advanced forward at night. The tongue is attached to the lower jaw, which drops back at night. So how do you keep your jaw forward while you're asleep? Well, you can do it while you're awake. You can do it while you're listening to me. But it's very difficult to do it at night, and that's why a there are many designs of splints that keep the mandible forward and keep the airway open. But not everybody can tolerate it. And there are many reasons why people can't tolerate a splint. One has to do with their jaw joints, and if um, and, and that is an important factor. Uh, another is to do with this loop gain. So if you have an exaggerated response to small changes in the level of CO2, which in turn change an obstructive sleep apnea problem to a central apnea problem. We have a breathing center in the brain that has nothing to do with the obstruction of the airway. A central apnea is, is a different story to an obstructive sleep apnea. So this is tying all these complex things together. And hey, you know, as I keep saying, the more I learn, the more I realize I have to learn. And uh, I only wish I knew as much as I thought I did when I graduated all those years ago. That's what makes health so interesting and enjoyable and uh, intellectually stimulating. I hope this finds you well. Until next time, this is Dr. Ron Ehrlich. Be well. This podcast provides general information and discussion about medicine, health and related subjects. The content is not intended and should not be construed as medical advice or as a substitute for care by a qualified medical practitioner. If you or any other person has a medical concern, he or she should consult with an appropriately qualified medical practitioner. Guests who speak in this podcast express their own opinions, experiences, and conclusions.